The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to um, today's Make for All community call. I'm just going to make sure that I'm sharing my screen so you all can see the presentation. Um, I think I think I am sharing my screen. Um, can you all see the slides OK? I don't uh, see I do not yeah, You don't see the slides. OK. You do I think I've got the baton here, Stephanie. Yeah. All right. Yeah. How about we now? We're good? Okay. Um, thanks so much for joining today's call. Uh oh. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties that we will work out. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's Make for All community call. Um, I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy um, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, my name is Steph Santoso, um, the Director of Maker Initiatives for Makers and Mentors Network, which is an initiative at the National Nonprofit Citizen Schools. Um, and, you know, in the past weeks and months we've, that we've been dealing with COVID-19, I think we've all experienced, seen, and read about how the virus has disrupted our lives and the lives of those in our local communities. Um, I was reading a statistic uh, earlier this week that noted that just in the U.S. alone, school closures due to the coronavirus has impacted at least 124,000 U.S. public and private schools, um, and that uh, that yields down to 51 million students, which is pretty staggering. Um, so today we'll be hearing from individuals in maker-centered learning who have been leading efforts in their own communities to respond to the needs around PPE, a personal protective equipment for healthcare workers on the front lines, and have been supporting students and families as they continue to learn from home. After we hear from each of our speakers, uh, we'll have some time in the last half of the call to have some discussion about how the response to COVID-19 has created valuable maker-centered learning experiences for students. Um, we'll also have a chance to talk about the existing challenges this presents in the future of maker-centered learning, which at least for the next few months is going to most likely be taking place at home. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Zach Weaver, who is creative technologist at Building 61 in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, Zach, hold on one second while I make you a presenter, and then I'll just hand it off to you. Okay. There you go. All right. I hope you're seeing a big slide that says Building 61. Yes, we Just are. Everybody, everybody got the right view. Great. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to share things with you today. Hi, everybody out there in the universe, in the world. Uh, it's great to be back in London, my hometown. I'm just kidding. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Building 61. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, we are a free community workshop that provides free maker education and access to maker technologies in a creative and inclusive environment. Um, we're an all ages space. Um, we're about 1500 square feet, um, totally packed with power. Uh, we've been open for about four years and have engaged somewhere a quarter million people through outreach and in-house programs. Um, one of those programs, something that we uh, initially um, had launched as part of our Make for All um, uh, outreach programs, uh, was what we call Space 61. Um, it was a high altitude launch, uh, high altitude balloon launch program where students designed um, the payloads and the electronics that would uh, go up. And um, I'll play that again as I'm still talking. Um, would go up and record uh, uh, relevant data uh, with, with electronics packages that they had um, built themselves. Um, program was a big success. Uh, we only uh, reached about 16 students in our first year. Um, most of those kids come from at-risk um, families um, as identified by their school systems. And uh, 
the, the, the funding looked really good. Um, we had a, have an internal foundation that funded us for 10,000 500 and then we got a cognizance um, make for the future grant also for this program that gave us an additional 20. So that was how we were going to hit our make for all uh, outreach goals. However, um, as we all know, things have shifted to a sort of emergent scenario. Um, my coworker, uh, Emily Plotzer, pictured there, um, very quickly designed uh, a mask sewing tutorial. Um, and as that was happening, we were getting uh, content online in English and Spanish through um, a new YouTube channel for us and uh, a GitHub page that includes all of that. Um, in addition, the now infamous raid on Building 61 allowed us to collect a few extra sewing machines and some 3D printers. And you can see uh, in that lower image, uh, I'm assembling um, that, that Prusa, uh, Joseph Prusa design face shield, which I'm hoping everyone's familiar with. Uh, and we're additionally printing some of those um, elastic clips that pull the elastic bands off of the ears of um, people wearing masks for extended periods now. Uh, and that has been um, our big response. We've donated around 100 of these fully assembled shields and we're approaching about 1,500 sewn masks. Um, the big initiative right now is, uh, as we've had a 70% reduction in staff due to furlough, is um, all of us are doing things like writing grants. My primary role right now is actually writing grants to fund the purchase of additional uh, Wi-Fi hotspots and the service for them, which uh, Building 61, along with the rest of our parent organization, Boulder City of Boulder and eventually Boulder County. Uh, we identified about 213 households with students that cannot afford uh, or do not currently have access to Wi-Fi. So we're partnering with the Boulder Valley School District to get them supplied first and then the rest of the community supplied second as um, our city and our organization are trying to get out critical uh, public health information and services and content increasingly move online. Um, here's some real specific numbers in case anybody out there on the call uh, is looking to fund a project like this. Um, we need to raise about $70.5 thousand dollars to uh, get an additional uh, number of hardware units in service to get us through six months. Oh, Zach, you're sending, you just cut out a little bit. Could you repeat that again? I, I think the part where you said you're raising $70,000 and then you cut out a little bit. Thanks, Steph. Um, yeah, so we need an additional 70,005 to hit our target of 400 households, which includes that uh, 213 BBSD students. Um, if anyone out there is uh, aware of or looking to fund a project such as this, uh, please reach out to that uh, email address at the bottom. And uh, with that, um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Zach. Um, and for those of you who has, have uh, comments or questions, um, please feel free to save those and then um, we'll have uh, time at the end for discussion. Um, and um, now I'm going to introduce another amazing Zach uh, in the maker education community, Zach Dowell. Uh, so Zach um, leads the Innovation Center Makerspace at um, Fulton Lake College. And um, he's gonna be sharing a bit more about what he's been doing uh, both as a, an educator, professor, um, and then also as a, a mentor to a number of the students that he's working with um, in the makerspace uh, uh, on campus there. Um, Zach, I'm going to make you presenter now, and you should be good to go. Are we good to go? Yep, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Great. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and thanks Zach for that that awesome work. The the Wi-Fi thing sounds cool, and I hope you are fully funded immediately. Um, so my name is Zach Dowell. I run. Uh, I'm a faculty member at Folsom Lake College, a public uh, two-year community college in the Sacramento region, and I run the Innovation Center, which is a discipline agnostic general education makerspace. And so we offer curriculum and open access and all sorts of things uh, similar to other spaces. 
And we're in a, we were a member of the CCC Maker Network. So in California, there was a, a multi-year grant to help community colleges um, stand up or improve uh, maker programs. It was a $17 million grant over two and a half years-ish. And uh, it helped 24 spaces um, either emerge and start programs or it, expand their program. And several of those are in Sacramento, the great and powerful Sierra College, um, Sacramento City College, American River College. Etc. And so Sacramento is a great maker region. And um, I've been thinking a lot and throughout uh, when I got the, the invite to talk with y'all. And um, I've been thinking a lot about the ecosystem and, and how it impacts our approach and the way that we've uh, um, done what we can to maintain continuity and um, help folks. Uh, and ecosystem thinking was a big part of the CCC Maker Grant. And we're friends with all the regional spaces and all the efforts. And so that's really come into play, I think. Uh, in terms of our response. So one of the things we've been doing is uh, PPE. So we've been creating shields and we've been sewing um, face masks and we've been also creating those ear savers. And we, um, well, we can maybe talk about supply chain. We had some interesting um, uh, issues relative to getting the materials that we need and, and getting the machines. But one of our kind of our, um, our approach to that has been to both plug into efforts, regional efforts, uh, such as you'll hear about in a moment from our folks from the uh, Hacker Lab, Rockland, um, but also seeking out uh, organizations with whom we already had some relationship. So I teach a sociology of making class and we've had visitors from Waking the Village Tubman House, which is a local um, organization serving uh, unsheltered folks and teen parents experiencing homelessness. And so we're working with them. So we essentially what we did was seek out these smaller organizations um, and, and we're working with them to sew uh, both adult size and child size masks specifically and to provide some face shields. And another institution with whom we've worked is Chapa Day Indian Health, which is a, a Native American clinic, a health clinic in Auburn, California. And we provided their um, nurses and healthcare workers with, um, with ear savers. We were able to do all that because on the day that, that the college closed, uh, I sent uh, all the 3D printers home with my student staff, um, which turned out to be a pretty, uh, it was a great move because a lot of, I was in the middle of teaching Maker 111, which is a digital fabrication class, a, a college credit class in our, uh, as part of our program. And suddenly all of my students were the whole class is about how to use the tools of a makerspace and so i was faced with this difficult um difficult challenge of of providing continuity and continuing remote instruction for them so so i sent my 3d printer many of our 3d printers home with my student staff and a bunch of filament and then they partnered uh, with students in my class in little clusters um, to complete the 3D printing portions of the class, which had to do with designing uh, and producing artifacts. And they collaborated using Zoom and other mechanisms. Um, and then uh, in terms of ecosystem and, and community, I just wanted to share that. So one of the other colleges in the CCC Maker Network is Moore Park College. And Claire Sadnick, who is a friend of mine from that network, reached out to us and said, hey, our students are missing the fellowship, they're missing the community, they're missing, um, you know, the the that that spirit of the maker space because her space is they're not allowed in as we are not either, and and our stu her students wanted to talk to our students and so um, Claire facilitated that conversation, and uh, I I have known Claire for years uh, but her students didn't know my students so they've been meeting weekly, and trying to come up with ways to preserve that kind of maker spirit and make at home stuff, um, make at home kinds of projects. So one of the, the first ones they came up with, which I encourage you all to um, take part in is a thousand maker cranes project. So one of the Moore Park students um, inspired by that sort of thousand cranes project uh, produced a video and uh, is encouraging folks to kind of do that. With, and they're thinking of other projects that, that folks can do with materials that they have uh, at home. And so if you are interested in our work, um, please check out FLC Makerspace on Instagram uh, or flcmakerspace.org and uh, my work I document at Noise Professor and flcinnovation.org. So I thank you for the invite and that concludes so my remarks. Zach. And, um, and I think that the, uh, yep, hand snaps all around. <laughs> um, I think that your point about sort of the importance of ecosystem and, 
you know, really at a time like this where things are time sensitive and urgent, um, leveraging the really deep relationships you already have with organizations um, because you have worked with them is so critical. Um, and I also love just the, the flexibility that your space has. Um, and I think Zach mentioned it too, in terms of being able to actually um, take the, the equipment out um, given that you don't have access to space, like that's that in, in and of itself is like an interesting sort of, uh, policy mechanism for making sure that the, the technology gets utilized when the space can't can't be utilized. Um, so um, uh, more on that, I think, in our discussion. But um, um, now I'm really excited because uh, we're going to have um, some student voices represented. Um, and so I wanted to introduce um, Aaliyah uh, Smith Brown and Kai. Is it Ulrich? I think it's Ulrich or Ulrich. Yes, that's Ulrich. Um, and uh, Kai and Aaliyah are both uh, student leaders at Sierra College. And um, Aaliyah, I'm going to make you a presenter now. Um, so you should be able to share your screen. One second. Okay. Um, and I'll turn it over uh, to you all to, to tell us more about what you're doing as students. First of all, hello, everyone, and thank you for having us here today. I really appreciate it. So while we're waiting for the slides to load. <laughs> I know there's always a technical delay. I love technology. <laughs> um, okay, let's try that again. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay, so, oh. <laughs> there we go, okay. <laughs> Getting into prison. Okay. So uh, once again, my name is Kai Oric, and I just kind of wanted to give everyone a little recap on what Operation Shields Up is, just in case you haven't heard of it before or whatever. So it's a volunteer-based program, and what they're doing is they're creating personal protection masks for medical workers, and their mission statement is to ensure that all first responders and anyone working in the healthcare industry has the correct equipment they need to successfully, to successfully fight the pandemic on the front line. Once again, if you do not already know, this was created by Alan Puccinelli, who is the creator of Operation Shields Up and also a partner with Sierra College and the Sacramento Valley Medical Society. And what I find really interesting is that this is all taking place outside of, or inside of the Hacker Lab. Sierra College actually has four printers in the print farm at the Hacker Lab, and then four printers have been liberated from Sierra College and split between the two of us, so Aaliyah and I, which I think is really, really amazing. Awesome. So, uh, all right. So my name is Leah Smith Brown. Um, a little bit about me. I am, hold on, <laughs> a student ambassador for Sierra Makerspaces. So I work with students and faculty to bring more maker center learning to the campus and curriculum. Um, I also just got hired as an AmeriCorps Maker Fellow. So I'll be working with citizen schools to bring more of the maker center learning into the K-12 programs within our community as well. Congratulations. Um, my major is <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My major is um, Studio Art and Business, and this whole experience with working with Operation Shields Up has been very valuable to me. Um, it has been really meaningful being able to use the skills that I've learned in making in the past couple of years in order to help the world in the time of need and our community. Um, it's also been really educational because for me, I wasn't really good at 3D printers. I never really used them, but in the last month or so, I've learned a lot about the equipment and why it's so important to kind of use maker learning in this time of need. So, pass it over to Kai. There you go. So once again, my name is Kai Oric. Uh, I'm actually the founder and owner of Kai and Associates. So currently, or what Kai and Associates was doing before the pandemic broke out is we were working as a consultant at Sierra College and we're maintaining and installing 3D printers at both Sierra College and just in the greater Sacramento area overall. This led me into working directly with Sierra College to find new and unique ways to implement 3D printing into the college curriculum. So of course, this isn't something I can do now because of the pandemic, we are all forced to be at home. So we, I've pivoted my company to just focusing on creating PPEs and just getting the right equipment there for people on the front lines who really need it. My major is engineering and business. And then just to kind of recap my whole Operation Shields Up experience, it has been so, so valuable of an experience to me because it has allowed me to give back to the community. And that's something that both me and my business have always wanted to do was to be able to give back to the community. And this is just a perfect way of doing it. It also goes to show that 
even just two people like me and Aaliyah can make a huge effort and huge contribution and help out a lot of different people. So with that being said, I think Operation Shields Up is a fantastic experience and I was really grateful to be a part of it. Right, say, um... <laughs> now we have some uh, involvement that we've done with Operation Shields Up. So a little bit of numbers. Uh, Kai and I combined have made 170 PPE face shields for the community, you know, donating them to Hacker Lab. And then we also wanted to include the website here. So um, Operation Shield Up is runs fully off of crowdsourced manufacturing. So anyone with a 3D printer can help. And so if you want to get involved, we have the website here where you guys can follow the link and get involved. And a huge thank you to both of you for, um, you know, just sharing the work that you're doing. And I think um, nothing makes a stronger case for why maker-centered learning and maker education is important than students like yourselves who um, are out there in the community and are actively using their experiences and skills um, to, to help where help is needed. And I can't think of a, a, a better example than this. So thanks to both of you for, for, for your work and also for sharing sharing it with, um, with us. Yeah, no problem. Um, so um, next, I'm really excited to introduce Eric Salim, who um, Eric is um, leading efforts at North Carolina Central University, um, where uh, they're really actively engaging um, K-12 students in maker education and digital fabrication. Um, so Eric, um, uh, I will turn it over to you. I'm gonna make you a presenter now. Um, and North Carolina Central University is actually also one of our uh, first Maker Fellows host sites. So that's a really exciting thing as well. So we've got a couple of Maker Fellows host sites um, on this call. And Eric, we can see your slides and um, I'll hand it off to you. Wonderful. I'm interested to know, am I like one of the only maker spaces on the call on like East Coast? Um, let's see. We've got well, we've got Kristen um, Burris who will be um, speaking after you, and Kristen um, is actually in Tennessee, so she's also on the East Coast. So there's we've got some good geographical variation. Um, and then Erica Compton is going to be talking to us a little bit later, and she's in Idaho. So uh, the first couple of speakers were West Coast. Um, now we're we're moving east, and then we're, we'll be back on the west. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I I admire all of the work uh, that the West Coast is doing in the makerspace ecosystem. Uh, you all are really leading uh, the charge as it relates to makerspaces and its impact in the community as well as education. So I applaud you all uh, what you're doing there. But uh, I'm representing uh, the North Carolina Central University Fab Lab. Uh, we are in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, we are the other Durham University. Uh, we are one of over 1,700 member uh, Fab Labs of a Fab Foundation. Fab Foundation is an outreach for the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Uh, this program is about democratizing the tools of digital fabrication and innovation. Uh, so we all have to follow the Fab Lab Charter. Uh, so in doing so, we have to open up uh, our facilities to the community. Uh, so part of what we do in our mission is engage, I say a critical mass of underserved and underrepresented populations in computation and digital fabrication. Um, although I'm showing young people on the screen, we do have older people in the lab. I think our oldest participant is 75. So we say K through 75 is who we serve. Since COVID, of course, um, things at the lab have, have been disrupted, but it has allowed a lot of opportunity also. Uh, so one, our facility has been closed, what seems forever and ever, but it's only been about a month or so. Um, it says on the slide, all of our programming has stopped, but most of it has, because we still are doing some things uh, through the fab lab. But although the facility is closed, we're working on limited capacity. Our users still want to use the space and there's still demand for our capabilities in the space. So to kind of support what we've been doing through K through 12 education, 
as well as some capstone projects on the university campus. We put everything on the cloud and on web-based software. So our 3D printing is being run through the Polar Cloud, which is where we queue all the prints in a repository and then download them to print. Um, K through 12 has to do these learning on web instructions. So we've been using Tinkercad and Tinker um, to do 3D design and coding uh, with these classes to kind of keep them still engaged. Uh, thanks to, to Tinker for giving us free access to their for fee website. Uh, and Raspberry Pi, uh, we've been using as a platform in some of our capstone projects. And that platform allows you to code uh, their development boards remotely. So students are still able to work on some of the projects that they started before the facilities closed. Um, we're having an issue with synchronous and asynchronous instruction. What's better? Um, we are set up for asynchronous, um, but a lot of people want us to do more synchronous instruction. Um, but we have a capacity issue as it relates to being on site with the equipment and projecting that to our broader audience. Um, so that's been an issue that we've having to deal with. Uh, also, printing things remotely um, presents an issue with troubleshooting because uh, no one is supposed to be on campus and I have to hustle to, to campus to try to deal with issues as it relates to 3D printing um, and collecting prints to then ship them out. So shipping has now become a thing in the lab as it relates to budgets um, and fees, collecting fees to ship things out. But the opportunity that has presented itself is um, making PPE for our healthcare facility here in North Carolina. NCCCU is part of a network of what we call educator maker spaces which includes university, community colleges, as well as community spaces. And we all have got together to kind of service this need. We are using a Persia um, face shield. Um, a lot of liability is associated with doing respirators. So to decrease the liability, we all selected to do the face shields. So we have a lot of 3D printers on site. So we we print a portion of the overall face shield. That's then shipped to a central location where they're then packaged and sent to whoever may need to use them. So that's kind of the presentation. I think I might have went over a little bit, uh, but that's us and how we're coping during the COVID-19. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and I think you sort of pointed out some really interesting challenges, um, you know, specifically as you're uh, trying to support students, the synchronous versus asynchronous learning opportunity there, um, but just also the challenges of setting up the infrastructure um, for asynchronous learning. Um, and then and then also um, kind of the, the really interesting um, sort of supply chain models that are developing. I think Zach referenced it as well. Uh, Zach Dowell referenced it where, you know, you sort of have um, individual spaces or individual makers um, helping to produce units of PPE and then shipping them or, or dropping them off in one centralized location. It's been really interesting to see how different um, regions and states and cities are um, kind of finding their own um, model that works well for them. Um, so um, we've got two more speakers and then um, we'll, uh, we'll be able to kind of engage in a, um, a joint discussion. Um, so the next um, speaker that I wanted to introduce is Kristen Burris and Kristen is the lead um, for digital fabrication um, for the digital fabrication ecosystem for Hamilton uh, County Schools um, in the greater Chattanooga area and um, I'm really excited to hear from her because um, she has been working with educators and administrators who have really been mobilizing around um, supporting uh, the need around PPE for healthcare workers. So Kristen, um, I will make you a pre presenter right now, um, and then you should be able to share your screen. Great. 
Perfect. We can see your slides. Are we there? Yep. We're, right. we're all here. Well, hi, everybody. Um, you know, it's it's been really interesting listening to everybody's story because our stories are so similar. Um, yet there's nuances. And so uh, our story, again, is, is very similar to other folks. Um, I am the digital fabrication ecosystem lead. Um, I actually work at STEM School Chattanooga. That's my home base. Um, and our school district actually has um, fab labs in uh, middle and high schools. And, in, and next year, we're going to include um, some fab labs in elementary. Right now, there there's some STEAM um, labs going on. Um, and so our digital fabrication ecosystem actually is a K-14 um, system. We um, are building the Global Center for Digital Innovation um, on our community uh, colleges, Chattanooga State Community College's campus. And that'll actually be my home base as soon as it's open. Um, I still see people out there working working on it, but I have a feeling we may have a later start date than October, which was our, uh, you know, when we were really hoping to be open. Um, but this is sort of a map of our uh, county. Our county is the same size as Rhode Island, roughly. Um, it's a pretty huge county. We have over 45,000 students and 79 um, schools. And so out of those 79 schools, by next year, um, we should have 24 fab labs. Um, in, in the system. So it's it's a pretty big percent, I guess, of our system, but you know, we're always looking for ways to um, to expand that. Um, so everything changed when you know COVID happened, obviously. And um, I was gonna show you this cute little video. I don't know if anybody else has a Dremel, but they sing such a sweet little song when they first come on. Um, however, there they go. Um, so one of the first things is we called all of our fab labs and we said hey we need your 3d printers and um so this is sort of our timeline uh so march 19th was the last day of school or the first day was zero kids and we realized we didn't have anyone in one of our stem schools so we called up all the fab labs and um, stem labs in town and we started gathering them so by march 27th we had 63 printers um, from 21 different schools all in one central location and um, we also and this is something I didn't add but apparently it's really important is we got a special um, permission from both our school board and um, I guess the Chattanooga State Community College to be on campus so we we were essential employees we got a letter from the superintendent so that we could actually be on site using the printers in one location and we did that and it was really all about supply chain it's a lot easier to monitor 63 printers with five people than having 63 people take a printer home um, and we just didn't really have that capacity um, so we've been running two shifts a day with five to eight volunteers per shift trying very hard to do social distancing. It's, it's easy to forget, but we're, we're working on it um, ourselves. But we've had over 60 different volunteers from um, all of our Hamilton County schools working um, pretty much full time. Uh, by April 17th, we had delivered 1,000 face shields. Uh, we have lots of local healthcare facilities that have been able to um, get those shields. And then today was our last day officially of shield production, and we had made 7,199 face shields. I guess it's just such an odd number. If we'd made one more, it would have been even, but anyway. Um, but we do have some local business partners like VW. They're going to continue um, with production on the last couple of days of production, um, they actually started injection molding. Um, VW you bought a new machine or had a new machine on one of their lines and they fitted it to, or retrofitted it so that it could start making these headbands. Um, you'll see in the pictures at the top, we're also using the Prusa, um, um, the plans off the Prusa website. When we took it to local healthcare workers, the one thing that they noticed is they didn't like that it was hollow. And if you did any um, prototyping or you know iterating, the the design from Prusa that had a solid headband A took forever and ever to print. But it also it was so rigid it was very very uncomfortable. So what we did for that is we found polyurethane foam and um, laser cut it. Now. 
So I have a slide all about the good and the bad, right? So if you've ever laser cut polyurethane, um, it makes hydrogen cyanide gas, which is really awful. So um, we, we found that out the hard way, but we did have an externally ventilated um, laser. And so that's where we were doing um, all of our foam cutting. Um, on Easter Sunday, we had a tornado. Uh, and it took out part of town. It was really devastating and terrible. So in the midst of a crisis, we had a second crisis. Um, so quite a few of our volunteers then were splitting their time helping people who were affected by the tornado on top of um, on top of everything else. It was just ridiculous. Um, I expected locusts. I'm glad they didn't come. Like that was only one more step. Um, but talking about some of the things that worked really well, um, supply chain was tough like it took us it took us almost as long to print the first thousand as it or to assemble them as it did the whole getting up to seven thousand because we would run out of hair bands or we would run out of foam or we would run out of mylar for the for the visors but um local businesses have gotten on board um we actually um had a local business test bros that started um cnc cutting the mylar and they could they have just a humongous cnc machine so they could do many, many more at a time than we could laser cut. Um, Under Armour, if you can see all the boxes of Under Armour, they donated 10,000 hair bands because they saw a post on Twitter where uh, one of the doctors had um, the hair band on the back. Um, and then we weren't really, like, I was really surprised how much you had to do to the, um, the bands uh, different printers have very different quality. And so some folks would donate the, um, the, the head bands and we would have to spend some time cleaning them and like scraping off the little, little bits or using sandpaper or things like that. So we've had the ups and we've had downs, um, but here's a picture of some of the healthcare workers wearing our very attractive um, shields the, the foam is always crooked. We just can't make it not crooked. I don't know why, but um, those are some of the folks that have definitely made this happen. Um, and then you can see one of the pictures, uh, some of the folks that were, we were working with were trying to retrofit sort of an N95 alternative mask, but um, that really wasn't going anywhere. Um, it made more sense to use all the printers that we could um, for the face shields um, instead of hopping down that bunny trail. We just didn't seem to have the right um, type of filament to make it soft and, and stick. Um, but anyway, so that's sort of us. We do have a, uh, a GoFundMe um, going on. The original goal was $35,000, but that was if we were continuing to do printing past 10,000 shields. Um, it is less now, but where we think we need to spend some money and continue hopefully to raise money is that we now have a surplus. Um, and so we've got these boxes of face shields we'd like to be able to send to folks in need. Our um, healthcare system here in Chattanooga is, is doing pretty well. Like they, they, we've given them a ton of shields, um, but we know there's other folks that may still need them. So um, that's kind of our next step in the process. And um, that's, that's us. And so I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kristen, and um, really amazing uh, uh, to hear kind of the story of how, um, you know, as a district and a region and a community, however you want to call it, um, you were able to uh, mobilize so quickly and uh, and also just to hear kind of the sort of challenges of like sort of trying to um, on the fly understand like what how you can most effectively use the resources and skill sets you have, right, given that there's a broad variety of PPE needs um, and uh, only so many te technological uh, resources and time. So um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, now we're traveling over to Idaho. <laughs> um, and we're going to be hearing from Erica Compton um, with the Idaho STEM Action Center, and she's going to be sharing more information about Idaho Makers Unite and uh, kind of the statewide effort that she's been helping to um, to, to co-lead and coordinate around uh, connecting uh, makers to um, the, the needs around um, uh, PPE in her state. Um, I'm going to make you a presenter right now, Erica. All right. I think you should be good to go. Yep. We can see your slides. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
as, as Stephanie said, I'm with the Idaho STEM Action Center, so I'm a statewide uh, agency under the Office of the Governor, and we have um, been working, well, we do STEM education and workforce development statewide, cradle through career, so all ages, and um, it, we had a Make for All initiative called, um, phew, right out of my head. Idaho Makers for Equity, where we were looking at pulling makers together from across the state to access or to help us create um, educational materials for uh, the deaf, uh, sorry, for the blind uh, or visually impaired. So we kind of had that initiative already where we were kind of pulling makers together. Um, and then when COVID-19 hit, we said, let's, how, how do we kind of pivot that initiative to focus on um, on the kind of the current crisis. So we created pretty quickly uh, the initiative called Idaho Makers Unite, and um, the goal was, again, as a statewide agency, how do we connect the makers that are already out there doing amazing things? Who Idaho was a little late in the game in the sense of being hit with this, and so we had lots of time. Um, and I had been following internationally kind of the movement and how they were responding. And so um, we already knew that makers were going to start this, whether whether they were there was support around them or not. So I said, let's try to support. Let's try to provide what we can. So the website is uh, allows makers to register with us and tell us what they're making. It allows facilities to register and request PPE. It provides health and safety guidelines. It has certain kind of popular um, patterns and or files that have been meet, you know been used and have been successful. And then it has some of the CDC and NIH guidelines for people to follow as well. Um, so that's kind of what we we launched about, I guess it's been about a month ago. Um, we recognized as a state agency it was going to be hard to kind of tell makers what to make, those independent kinds. Um, so some had their 3D printers and really wanted to make the Montana mask design. Uh, some were sewing, some were doing the ear savers. We had lots of face shields being created. So, um, so again, just trying to be a matchmaker and connecting the maker with the facility, having them have a conversation around what was their, what was the best uh, kind of option for them, and then facilitating that process. Um, so just so far, we have about 75 different maker organizations or individuals. Some of those organizations have 200 members. Uh, we have a local kind of in my area sewing group um, who I think has 200 and another one that's got about 350. So we've got those two really large ones. And then we have some individuals just cranking things out. We have library consortiums who pull together kind of a coalition in their area. Um, and they are producing, say, the face shields. Um, and, and I can just call on them and say, okay, I have, a, I have a request here, and I connect them, and then they can either, if they're regional, they can deliver or have pickup, or they can uh, ship it. And right now, we've had about 60 organizations or facility requests. Right now, I've got some stockpiles of stuff around the state. So um, we're, we've partnered with three of the largest TV stations in the state, and we are doing some great PSAs to um, get the word out that facilities now, you know, we, we need more requests, frankly. We're part of the nationalmasksnow.org um, organization. I'm the state lead and I have a co-lead uh, in Northern Idaho that's kind of helping me. Um, I think I might be getting pounds of fabric here shortly and 50 spools of thread, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but they, they have sourced some materials to be able to share. In addition, on, that, on our webpage, we also made some small grants available. At first, I had 20, kind of a $25,000 bucket, um, but I'm at $33,250 requested. Um, and so every day, basically, we review applications, and every Friday, we award those anywhere from, say, 250 to 2500 for some of the larger groups. So we've had, uh, I, I have a 35000 I just uh, awarded a couple more today, so we're at 35,000, and I'll go back and probably ask if I could get another five to 10,000 to help support um, more makers, help offset costs, help with shipping. 
uh, these are just a few of the makers kind of uh, at work and or on the left, the, the gentleman wearing the face shield, that's from Salmon, Idaho, which is such a remote city, <laughs> city, town, it's called a frontier town. Um, and uh, the Salmon Public Library up there worked with their Reese Memorial Hospital to create a, sp a face shield specifically designed for them. And that was one of the first ones that went out. Um, the big picture with the elderly gentleman, that's Marty Mueller, who is at Gizmo Makerspace in Coeur d'Alene, uh, here over in I North Idaho, one of the most amazing makerspaces I've been in across the country. Uh, it's a pretty extraordinary place. And then a group of sewers just down in um, Shoshone, Idaho, cranking machines, you know, <laughs> getting their machines going and, and, and sewing away. And I just love that, you know, um, I thought it was funny when Stephanie said, you know, if you have pictures of your makerspace you want to share. Well, everybody's makerspace right now is kind of their basements uh, and kitchen counters. Uh, mine is my din dining room table, which I have a picture of at the end of this. Um, but it's been just really incredibly rewarding to be interacting with makers across the state, seeing them, you know, jump in uh, with both feet to help and support people across the state, not just in their region. You know, if they can, they're shipping them for me, which is really neat. Uh, so um, two other, well, so we've very briefly, two other initiatives. We launched STEM at Home, actually even the week before Idaho Makers Unite, we launched STEM at Home to provide daily learning resources for parents uh, struggling with homeschooling their kids. Uh, we've partnered with two of the radio stations, or sorry, TV stations, and we're doing morning um, STEM uh, kind of little short experiments, both online um, on Facebook Lives and also on TV. So we're doing some fun things trying to connect across this, across the state with different uh, learning resources, and then people can go to the resource portal, kind of put in the grade level, the area they want to do, if it's hands-on, and they can pull up an activity that will support them. Uh, another activity or another thing that just launched is a national initiative, uh, Code to Success. We just jumped on board and um, are providing 2,200 free scholarships for kids to join that. It's typically $200. Um, so we have 2,200 kids that can join free in Idaho, seven to 12th graders doing web development. It's kind of another way to try to support um, students and what's happening. And what I didn't put in the uh, PowerPoint it, that just kind of happened is we are partnering with a couple of key companies uh, in the Treasure Valley area, which is around Boise, the capital, and two of the largest school districts for free um, internet access, and devices. So we are working with some companies whose employees can then can do their giving kind of comes through us to help support and get Wi-Fi and or devices into the hands of kids in need. Um, and we're expanding that into other regions across the state as well so shortly. Um, I, it, I think what's been funny is my world has changed drastically where I feel like I'm rolling the dark web looking for elastic. So I'm now buying elastic by the pound uh, wherever I can find it and shipping it across the state. And we were lucky to get a roll of MERV uh, 16 fabric from a filter factory delivered to be used uh, in for the filtered masks, uh, for the filters in the masks. Um, so I have conversations and I'm doing activities that I never thought would uh, kind of be in part of my job, but it's been, a, it's been a whole lot of fun, I must say, it's been a whole lot of fun. Um, and that's my dining room table that's got 3D printers and sewing machines. Um, <laughs> no food, but that's that's my maker space right now. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Erica. Um, and really amazing to hear about just uh, the work that has been happening across the state to really connect supply and demand. I think that is continues to be a challenge for, for lots of different regions and states. Um, but it, it sounds like Idaho Makers Unite has really um, been incredibly effective in, in fostering that, uh, you know, um, matchmaking between the supply and demand um, 
out there in Idaho. Um, uh, well, I know that we're, we're running, of course, we always, with with these calls, we have such great um, share outs. Um, we don't have a ton of time for questions, but we probably have about five minutes. I did want to see if any of um, our participants had questions. If you do have a question, um, you're online. Um, if you use the hand raise, um, feature, the little hand raise icon. If you click on that, um, I can unmute you if you have a, a question um, for um, our speakers, um, or if you even have a comment or something that you wanted to share um, related to this topic or any of the topics that um, were brought up over the course of the past hour. So, um, oh, I think we've got, a, we've got Mary Adams from Cincinnati. Hi, Mary. Um, I've unmuted you. Um, I saw your your hand. Um, would love to hear your question or, or your comment. Oh, Mary, can you hear us? The, the, oh, the got call, you. the webinar, we got a grant proposal approved, but what you all just shared with me was better than that. You just showed the best of our country you guys and just want to shout out to all of you and I put some information into Steph about um, polar clouds with us here in Cincinnati and with GE additive they are grant they still are running their program to grant 3d printers to schools uh, Steph, I gave you the link so if you got a school that wants to apply go for it it's a great program and thanks for a shout out from those who work with them Steph, you have to, have to, have to find a way to tell this story more broadly than just to those of us who were on the webinar it inspires y'all. We're, we're really unhappy about these deaths. We're unhappy to be number one in the world on number of cases and deaths. But you all are the best of America, and we've got to tell a story. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um for that uh, comment, uh, Mary, and uh, yeah, I mean, I would I would welcome ideas for you know I think there are different ways that I've seen people sharing out their story, whether that's on social media or um, you know in blog posts or op eds or um, other kinds of articles. But um, yeah, I think you know certainly this webinar was like an attempt for us to be able to kind of take a deeper dive around um, what some of us are doing um, uh, in response to PPE and, and, and supporting students and families um, during this really critical time. Um, but uh, Mary, I will um, follow up with you. I'll make sure to send that um, link around the funding opportunity for 3D printers out to everyone, um, to the entire Make For All uh, listserv. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'd love to kind of follow up maybe as a next step to think about other ways that we could share, share this. Um, Kai, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I actually wanted to ask Zach Dahl if he could elaborate on his question that he asked me in the chat. I was a little confused on it. I just wanted some clarification. Because he asked uh, me, uh, yeah. Kai, I'll connect with you offline. I, we we are okay. also a recipient of a Maker Fellows position, so we're looking for mm -hmm. an AmeriCorps uh, person to work in at Folsom Lake College. So I'm just okay. networking, trying to see if you know anyone in your orbit. Um, <laughs> not at the moment, but I'll definitely talk to you after. So let us know. We got four maker fellows, so let us know if anybody wants to come to Idaho and work. Um, you, you all are totally on the same page as us. So um, Brian O'Neill, who's the director of um, our Maker Fellows program, is actually going to uh, say a few words about um, how we're in the midst of recruiting. So it's very well timed. Um, before we get to Brian, though, um, I wonder if anyone else had any questions um, of any, any other participants. We probably have time for one more question. Um, uh, if not, um, I was, I actually had a question. Um, I was really interested in, there were a couple of examples that you all referenced around how um, some of the work you're doing, you know, isn't just K-12 students, isn't just college students, you know, it, it actually involves multiple generations um, getting involved. And I was curious about the impact that you think that, that, that this has had, right? The opportunity for um, you know, makers and individuals of different generations to be able to respond to a community need together. Um, what 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 kind of an impact do you think that has, and why it's why it's valuable? Zach, go for it. We were on a very specific front. I think that one of the 
silver linings in all of this is that um, we have we collectively have a better understanding of what at home manufacturing and small scale custom manufacturing means. Um, whereas in uh, in fat times over lean times, um, we we tend to take these things uh, a little bit more for granted and to maybe not uh, exploit them for their fullest uh, potential to help. Um, we've, we've all played with Tinkercad and we probably all train students from, I, I love the expression K to 75, um, that uh, ends up making a bunch of plastic tchotchkes. Um, and, and it's interesting to see that same technology now in the hands of the public and in the school systems, um, actually providing direct response support to um, people that are um, at risk uh, so I, I think that's that's one aspect of this that I that I think is um, pretty remarkable, and it's it's good to finally see. I wish it was under different circumstances, of course, but I I think maybe this is an awakening in a way of of what it means to have access to these tools in your community. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Zach. I um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. So uh, something that I was thinking is I think it's actually really useful because we're getting different levels of wisdom from different people. And so when we combine all these people together, we're coming up with a much better product than we would have if it was just a certain age group or just a certain major or something along that line. And I also think uh, on a separate note that this is also the first time that we've seen the real application of crowdsource manufacturing too. So I thought that was very interesting because Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe I've seen anyone do something to this scale of crowdsource manufacturing before. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and probably in large part because up to this point, well, especially if you think about additive, right, 3D printers, um, this is, uh, it hasn't been before up to this point, uh, the the ubiquity of, of having access to a 3D printer has not been what it was and even now right not everyone has a 3d printer but um prior to this it was you know incredibly expensive technology to have so um zach dell <laughs> just a just a tiny i think it's also worth noting the fiber the fiber arts communities that exist and had existed a lot of the efforts in placer county for or excuse me eldorado county are um, networks that already existed to so blankets for veterans, et cetera. And so the big effort in the sewn mask is is being led by communities around a quilt shop in Placerville. And, I, and so um, that's a manu that's a technology that uh, is in a lot more households than 3D printers. So it's been nice to see that kind of just, those that's communities great, rise up and do that. That's a really yeah. great point. Um, Erica. Well, I would just take on to that. I think it's really um, been wonderful because I think we forget sometimes the fabric arts, you know, certainly some maker spaces really embrace that. But I think, I, mean, I bet half of my sewists, which is a new word I've learned, um, are probably over the age of 60 and, you know, in their homes or part of church groups and, and you know, who already do this on a daily basis. They do this for their community and, and in many different ways. And they responded, you know, just instantly and formed their own groups. I mean, part of my challenge has been trying to keep up. I mean, I don't need to be the end all, uh, co you know, coordinator, but I want to leverage, right, the resources. So when I hear there's a group of 200 people, you know, somewhere in Grangeville, Idaho, how do I tap into them and how do I support them funding or just connecting them, you know, because there are so many different groups. Um, I think that's been the most challenging thing for me is, everything's a moving target because things are changing so rapidly, both the requirements of what people need and also the, res uh, the restrictions or the, the guidelines from CDC and NIH. I mean, I spend hours, it seems, looking through things to find out information. That's been one of the biggest challenges. It's just, it's just been a constantly evolving, fast moving um, kind of phenomenon. Yeah, and having that infrastructure that is nimble enough to respond to those Rapidly changing needs is so important um, at the community, at the individual community level, but also regionally and statewide too. So, well, um, thank you so much um, to all of our speakers for for joining, and to all of you um, 
who participated and attended um, our call today. Um, before um, before we uh, leave, I did want to um, give my colleague um, Brian O'Neill um, a few minutes, um, just one or two minutes. I know we're um, running just a little bit over time um, because we had such great conversations, um, but wanted to give Brian an opportunity to talk real quickly about our new Maker Fellows program and um, how we're currently recruiting for really amazing fellows across the country. Brian, um, you should be able to uh, to uh, speak now. Great. Great, yeah, thanks, Steph, and uh, thank you all so much for all the work that you're doing. Um, I'm a I'm a New Yorker, and uh, this has definitely been one of the most uplifting and inspiring hours I've had at the time. So just really heartfelt thank you, and uh, really really inspiring stuff that you all are doing. Um, as Steph said, I'm the program director uh, helping to launch uh, the Maker Fellows program. So we're currently uh, recruiting 29 uh, national service uh, leaders across the country uh, to serve at 21 different uh, sites. Um, and these are folks that, you know, can be, it's a hybrid role of building capacity, doing outreach in local communities, schools, and uh, libraries, and building, bringing more folks into your maker spaces, as well as uh, facilitating and leading hands-on uh, projects directly with youth. Um, it's a national model that we're launching that we really want to have a hyper localized approach to really meet the needs of the specific communities where the maker fellows are uh, going to be serving. Um, so I, I know we're, we're at time, so just a quick plug that please help us spread the word. Uh, we are actively recruiting for these positions. It's a really, really unique uh, leadership opportunity. And shout out to uh, Aliyah. Great to, great to see you today. And uh, welcome to the team. Congrats. And uh, great to have somebody that make a fellow host site on this call. So um, I think I'll, I'll pause there. But please feel free to reach out if you have any questions and check out the website that uh, Seth has linked here for more information. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brian. And um, uh, the last thing is that we'll have our next community call on May 26th, um, uh, so uh, same time. And um, feel free to register. Um, the link to register is already online. Um, a huge thank you again um, to all of you who are, um, even if you weren't presenting today, um, who I know probably there are many of you on um, online that have been really helping to support um, the healthcare workers and students and families um, that uh, need it um, during this time. Um, thank you again, and uh, we will see you next month. Talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. You too.